All right, thank you. Uh, I'm up here without a mic. You can all hear me reasonably, I hope. Cool. Just came from the dentist, so if there's an extra B or H in something, that's why. I'm, I can almost feel all of my jaw again. Uh, good. Like James said, my name is Adam Crespi. I am the senior environment artist or senior artist on the machine learning team uh, at Unity. Um, I'm actually on the machine learning agents teams, that particular one, uh, where we make machine learning agent technology and an SDK for you to deploy machine learning agents throughout your game or other simulation. Okay. Uh, briefest bit about me. So I did my undergrad in architecture at SC, master's in education at Argosy only 20 something years in both animation games, architecture, interior design, um, that kind of thing. It's a lot of environment work along the way. That's how I managed to land there. Um, also helped form all of Unity's exams and a lot of the curriculum, and then jumped to machine learning about four or five months back. An opportunity presented itself, and they're like, hey, we need a, a guy who speaks environment. And I'm like, aha, you know, and there I am. Um, I'm out of our Bellevue office, about half my team's there, half is in San Francisco. I also work close with our autonomous vehicles guys and image-based learning. Um, okay, I need to calibrate to the audience. Programmers, good. Python programmers, C sharp, F, no, not F, no. Uh, let's see, what else? Game designers, Mazel tov. okay, animators, interested folk. People who are at least happy to have a chair. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> All right. So, how many have heard of machine learning? Let's start there. Good. What is okay? What is machine learning? Uh, I actually said this. Like, my mom asked, "What are you doing in the new team?" I said, "Machine learning team." She said, "What do you do?" I said, "Help machines learn." She's like, "Oh," and I'm like, <laughs> "You're licensed to drive." No, mm -hmm. really. Um, what is the idea? Okay, computers and software on them is inherently stupid. It's very fast and very stupid. The idea in machine learning is we want creative algorithm usage to teach our agents, our software in some way to do things to recognize and to think in some capacity on its own. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Um, if you've ever used, let's say, I don't know, Amazon, and it seems to know just what you want and sort of predictively searches and gives you stuff. That's machine learning in action. Okay. Have um, you ever been on the Unity Asset Store? And yeah, it seems to seems to find things in the range of what you're after. That's machine learning. There. Uh, the other thing we see machine learning for is like this part, like this corgi, agents who are trained to do something. All right. Uh, two major things we use in machine learning. There's reinforcement learning. There is imitation learning. They are exactly what they sound like. Reinforcement learning. Did you get the stick? Yes, I got the stick. Here's a reward. Okay. Or did you not bring me the stick? Here is a negative reward. Imitation learning then, I'm gonna demo fetching the stick. I want you to learn from it. Okay. So this is Papa. This is a demo we put out uh, for Unite Berlin. So we host a bunch of Unites around the world. You know, it's a chance for the, don't unplug things, chance for the Unity faithful to gather in like an Uber gaggle or whatever we travel in and uh, talk amongst ourselves. And this demo is really so we can show machine learning on a mobile device. And the idea is we're going to take this Corgi, and I'll bring, bring Puffo up here in a sec. Uh, we're going to take this Corgi and have it learn to, let's see, if we don't have bandwidth for video here, that's okay, I have a different demo. We're going to teach this Corgi to fetch a stick. Okay, so there's two phases to this. This is a spinning circle. So I'm going to jump into Unity and show offline. Okay. The idea in this scene, we would teach Puffo to fetch a stick. And there's some main components we're going to use. The first of is Pavo here. Um, he is a physics-driven rig. So the other thing we see a lot in machine learning is physics-driven animation. Crawlers or walkers learning to walk. And you get some really funny stuff in there. There's a lot of flailing around and flapping. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, and Pavo, in this scenario, actually learns to walk. It's a modification of our crawler demo. For those interested, I can refer you to the I want you to the GitHub to go get it and play with it. Uh, he learns to walk and then is trained for reinforcement learning to fetch the stick. So what we're seeing here in this scene is our training scene. Right? And what we tend to see 
in this. Let's just pick a bunch of stuff. We tend to see typically two phases, and the training does take a little while, so I'm not going to launch one here because watching Python scripts execute a command line is scintillating, um, and also takes takes a little while. The idea, though, in it basically is we're going to set up some training scenes. So you can see you've got backyards here with puffos on them, and we will train them by throwing Python code externally at a build or something similar. Uh, based on rewards we've set up, and it will learn to walk, to run, to not fall over when running, and then we'll start to throw the stick. Now, what does that look like when it's all done? We have puppet. And the idea then is let's just max on play. Once it's all done and trained, we get this. This is Puppo, and the idea is I'm going to pick up this stick, and I'm going to throw it, and Puppo is going to learn to do to go get it. Now, this is not a canned animation. This is a machine learning agent that has learned through reward, through reinforced learning, to go pick up the stick. And it's it's great. I mean, the derp factors you bought up here, and so people at Unite Berlin were like, "Oh, the corgis!" It was fabulous, you know. And since then, it's gotten like more press than the Deep Mind announcement for us and the deep mind guys are like you and your dogs we're like go dogs okay um and this is Puffo. and so again as i throw it Puffo gets a reward every time he goes and gets the stick he gets a reward for bringing it back reinforcing what's going on and Puffo has learned to walk and Puffo's learned to run and we're seeing because it's a physics driven animation that it's um you know it's a little long right now the idea on this, what I, as I said originally, this was a mobile demo. We put it out for Android and showed it at Unite on a Pixel, uh, later an iPhone. It was also a test bed for us to use TensorFlow Sharp on mobile and then to try an inference engine on that. How many have heard of TensorFlow? Good. Okay. Uh, it's Google. It's a it's a plugin to allow you to map machine learning onto things. How I'll put it. It's available for Unity. Um, and now we have the game. So again, you can go get this project and play with it when you're trained in it. Okay. Before I battle more on this, questions, things you want to throw at me, stuff I said that you're curious about, or am I just speaking at it briefly? Question in the back, yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So yeah. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about the actual training process and when it gets what we work? Is that what the sure. I will actually. Here, it's good you asked. It's kind of the next thing I was going to show. Um, it's a little hard to see on screen, I know. Typically, you're going to see two components in machine learning. You'll see an academy and you'll see a brain. And the idea in this is that the academy is going to control the training configuration. Right? Is there a time scale? So we do sometimes train beyond real time, real higher. Um, it also controls res. Um, if you're dealing in a visual based agent, it will control the res on the agent vision um, and control you know, quality level. That's the first part. Then we have the brain. And naturally, it's called dog brain. And the idea on this, the general process, we're going to make a training scene. We're going to make a build of it, typically desktop. Uh, right now, we are running Python and either Jupyter Notebooks or Anaconda outside, however you want to run it. You execute your training against that build, which produces a graph, maybe a TensorFlow graph or something similar, although you can use other models if you want. And those are brought back in and applied to the brain. So what we're seeing here is that this is a trained model, right? So it says, Papo has been trained we can also play Puppo as a player if we need, use other models or heuristic. In this case, what it says is we have built from Unity, we have trained, run our training Python scripts. scripts. Um, we have made a graph model called fetch model, and we have brought it back. And the other parts to it, there's my brain, canvas, that's good. Let me go to the training scene here. The other parts to it then, these are my training pieces. 
And here is an example is a training target. There it is. And it's got a training target script on it saying, where are you training? Who is being trained? Um, we're going to see things in there like on our Corgi. Okay. There's our joint system. And here's our joint drive. And then here is the dog agent where it's saying, what are the steps? Reset when done, and so on. And finally, this is the one where it's learning to uh, shrink the target, learning to run around. And here again is my training target. And this will have in that script rewards on it. Plus one, get the stick, and so on. So, a bunch of parts to it. Um, if you want to get more into it, because I'm watching my time here. Um, on our GitHub repo, it's open and public. You can go get. We're at beta 0.5 at the moment, and it's got install docs and how to and how to train and a whole bunch of other things. Okay. Um, at the moment, like I said, at the moment it is we're in beta. Uh, 1.0 will be due out at some point. Um, the reason it is external somewhat is there's a lot of interest in the research community. And they tend to want to work command line and not really in a GUI and not necessarily in Unity as much as throw code against the build of it. Uh, that's why you do see kind of external. And also, as you guys may have seen, um, recent years, Unity is really standardized on C Sharp to promote uh, job system ECS and things. And um, fitting a binding in Python um, at the moment is an external process. Okay, um, cool. So I will say that the 0.6 beta is coming. Again, worth a look. All right. um, and I'm going to show a couple other, uh, a couple of basic models in here to get kind of cool. Um, where would you use this though? Right. Making a dog that plays fetch obviously is kind of cool. Where would you want this? NPCs, right? Having your NPCs not only decide to fight a player, let's say will run, but having your NPCs understand small unit lands, okay? um, having NPCs behaving in a crowd set without the randomness of simply a Brownian noise applied. Now, again, if I'm speaking Swahili in there, please go, eh, dude, okay. I uh, get that a lot. Okay. Remember, if you're brave enough to ask questions, about four or five people going, oh, thank you. So speak up. Um, where else would you use this? We're seeing this kind of application in everything from auto visualization to building design to games to movie making, crowd sim, and other things. All kinds of places. Yes, sorry, question. Yeah. Uh, is this application kind of like the, um, the prison hiring thing with pickups? Uh, should Washington have the data to make it reliable for small games? Can you tell me about that? Mm -hmm. You know, the two two places we're really seeing a lot of interest. One is actually in QA, where we've got machine learning agents that will take a game. Let's say there's a you know a two D casual, right, and teach the agent to play. Let's say it's a simple match three or something similar. You can have an agent train and then play the game several million times, where you can't take that many testers in that amount of time. So it becomes where we use this a lot is where we have the, the need to balance either how many people can we buy, right, or time. And we can always take less time and throw more computers at it and makes it viable for an agent. That's the first one in QA. We have studios right now that are using machine learning agents, again, to QA games, to simply play games and record things millions of times. The other side we're seeing it, again, is non-player behaviors of some the data load is not too bad. So to train Puppo, I'll get you in just a second. The data load for Puppo, on this machine, it trains in like 45 minutes. If you take a little pokey or MacBook, it might take a couple hours. Uh, some of the other demos that are on our repo, like you know, a balance ball and things go fairly fast. Uh, some of them like a push block or learn to solve a problem takes a couple hours. It's not bad that the, the files themselves are not giant. It's really that at the moment you are working around in Python and training externally. So it does take a little programming. Yeah. 
Question, yes. It, again, it varies on machine, it varies by um, simulation. We are seeing a lot of folks who want to dockerize stuff and throw it against cloud, you know, however they want to do that. Sorry, if that's uh, completely out there, what is docker? I'm going to go to docker. Okay, good. Get your question just a sec. Basically, it lets you encapsulate a program or something in a container to then run multiple instances in a cloud of some fashion. Good frame. Okay, yes, plain question. Carefully, uh, typically with gloves and an apron. No. Um, okay, here's where this here's where this gets neat. Um, how many played in crowd sim? Good. Crowd sim typically typically you say, here's a bunch of essentially particles. Go the, go this way. Don't smack into the wall. Behave reasonably. Right. Give it some variety. It's neat. But you can tell occasionally somebody will walk into a phone booth or a parked car. You go like, wait a sec. Okay. What this allows you to do is to say, behave more realistically, right? Behave in a crowd um, like a bunch of people walking in the sidewalk. Learn to avoid each other. Learn to generally go in a direction, but be curious about going wrong. So it gives you, a, in some, some places, a more natural motion. Um, it's also more useful, again, because you can run it more times than you could in a standard scenario to get the very results you want. So it also gives you the artistic flexibility of pushing your iteration, your, your oh, sorry, the artistic flexibility of iterating more times to push your final decision making farther down the pipeline. Question back there. Uh, I think a really good example <laughs> seen some neat stuff in there. I, I've definitely seen some where you're like, I don't remember tanks being upside down correctly. But, you know, um, sometimes it works. Sometimes it gives you some very awkward results. Other questions. As a machine learning example. I would say that's probably a good behavior tree. I don't think it's a machine learning example. Uh, some some things I know about, some things I can say, and some things will, you know, the uh, the secret unity police would be in to get me instantly. So, yeah. Two questions. I mean, this work, well, I've written this work on some This is a team. Um, I helped a little bit on the environment and some of the training. Okay. Um, there's other things we're doing. I'm running lead on it. So it's a mix. So that's your follow-up. As a lead, what is your role in large and stuff? Do you run the program personally, or do you want to make sure it's running correctly? Do you want to and stuff to be like that? It's a mix. You know, the thing with training, if we talk about machine learning training, there is an element of experimentation. Because sometimes you're going to look and you go, wow, that stank. Let's do this again. It's OK. Uh, so sometimes, as a lead, typically we say on our team, because we do shift roles, the lead is the owner and the driver, uh, you know, from either a racy or a daisy diagram or something similar. Um, the lead is in charge of moving the overall project forward and planning. So we use Trello and Fabro interchangeably. Um, then there's other things I'm in there as a as a, as a consulting, but you know, informed or consulted, uh, or there's other leads, like there's another project I'm on that you'll hear about at some point soon. I'm a lead designer, but there's another guy driving the overall project. So we do share. Uh, yeah. Presumably, if you wanted to, could you potentially Yes. So if you look at a, a graph model, it's, it's a Python model. So yes. Um, you know what you're after, but yeah. It's like any code. It's easier to write it than to read it. Um, there are, let's see, without telling too much. One, it's new. 
it's a fairly new team at Unity. And we, we have a practice of not just launching stuff out in 1.0 and watch it face plan. That's typically bad practice. Um, there's a lot of under technical underpinnings that are getting added. Uh, even before we start to think about surfacing it in the editor properly. So beta because we are adding stuff, not because things are hardly broken. Uh, but there's a lot of work going on between our team and other teams to make sure it's not only a fully fledged product, but ties in with all the other things in the Unity world. Is, yeah. So That's since good. this seems like mostly like half different data, what are like some of your major challenges first like putting these things on the beta or alpha? Like what are your like what are your like major challenges with this thing? Uh, don't lock up users' machines. Um, let's see. Make sure that what version of Python things is clearly um, articulated. I'm going over things I've seen. I've seen uh, pull requests on. Um, what else? <laughs> Let's see. You know, I think a lot of it is two parts. It's not only QA and thorough documentation on the process. It's making sure it scales. Because uh, a lot of times you say, well, this this works great. What happens if we have twelve of these running? Oh, it catches on fire. Well, you know. So that, that's a lot of it. Also, there, there's a lot of interconnected stuff. You know, we're using TensorFlow that's somebody else's. We're using Python bindings to make it come into Unity. Okay, that's somebody else's. You know, you see stuff done in Jupyter Notebooks. All right, that's somebody else's. Okay, let's play nice with the rest of Unity. Okay, what happens if we're running it lightweight? There's a lot of contingencies to think about. Uh, yeah, I'll field as many as I can. I have a couple more things I want to show. Go ahead. Yes, uh, where we're seeing that is actually on the image side, uh, two parts. So one is there's a team working with the asset store guys, uh, and there's a lot of generating things and comparing them. We do see that. Um, you can set a model to compare if that's a reward you need. So, uh, on that one, and there was another, another question I saw, I will come back to you in a sec. The other thing we can do in here is use curiosity, exactly as it sounds. We can say to an agent, not only go there, do the thing, but be curious, right? Explore, um, and we can reward for that. And then we do get agents that are curious and compare routes, compare uh, challenges, look for reward. So it shows up, it depends where you want it to show, but yes. Um, Question, yes. Um, so, machine learning isn't necessarily hidden right here. So, in fact, you see a lot of animation over here. Mm -hmm. um, when you say that um, machine learning is all kind of AI in the same way, you can see, I guess, how, how do you think it's the best way to do that? Do you think that makes a reasonable drawing? How fast do you think yeah. that machine learning is more than? Um, it is exponentially crazy. Uh, we are seeing research institutions all over the world doing machine learning in Unity. Um, you know, we just announced we partnered with DeepMind. Um, you know, on I don't know, fairly amazing large things, most of which is you know completely black box and governed by more NDAs, but. Um, it is enormous. You know, we're seeing it in a lot of fields. You know, it's, it's the same idea in self-driving cars. Don't hit the truck. That's a good reward. Yeah. Um, we're seeing it in, uh, like I said, so many different industries and verticals. And it's still so new that I think, I think the growth is exponential. It is somewhat of a wild west sometimes. You know, we're seeing folks that are like, I use Majuko. Physics driven environment for things. And we're like, yay, it looks terrible. And they're like, yes, but I have robots that can pick up stuff, you know, and it's, it's absolutely innovative. And then we got folks running around stuff in Unity and they're going, look, it looks amazing. And this machine learned to make toast. I'm like, yay, toast. Uh, it's, it's fairly amazing. Uh, one more quick. I'm not going to pull the quick. Yes.
in this dog? No. Can we? Yes. Now, if you ever try to motion capture a dog, it's a unique experience. I highly recommend doing it with people instead. Um, it's a good, a good question on that. Let me uh, pull that one question back there for a second. If you look at what goes on in animation, right, is there an established pipeline for animation? Getting it into Unity, uh, switching between states, you know, transitioning? Yes. Is there an established pipeline for mocap? Absolutely. Do we want to animate things via physics? Sometimes. In this case, we chose to animate by physics after some experimentation with other uh, examples. We, saw, we thought this motion would be lovably awkward on this dog as we ran with it. This is not a mocap dog. That is the dog learning to walk by physics joining its limbs. So that is a design preference, not a machine learning preference. Uh, that's a question of how we wanted it to look and what we wanted to do. If you're doing it in a game, you may say, okay, great. I've got this keyed animation for a character. It's on a humanoid rig animation type. Um, and that way I've got multiple bipeds mapped on, et cetera, et cetera. And I really want the machine learning agent to trigger the right state, right? In which case it's gonna function like a traditional animation, simply what is driving the parameters um, is gonna be the machine learning agent. Uh, there's another question. Yes, way in back. Make, make a project better. Well, um, I got an app from Google. It's called the Make Good Button. Uh, no, I wish. Are you kidding? That'd be that'd be dog amazing. Um, I mean, typically in my workflow, I run around in either 3ds Max or Maya, both substances. Um, I do a lot of work in Illustrator because because of Illustrator, um, Photoshop naturally. Um, what else? I don't know. If I need for our architecture guys, I'll run around and rev it because, because building information models are sexy beasts. Um, what else? You know, I, I don't particularly say a program is going to make things better. Um, I mean, I some guys on the team are like, Blender! And I'm like, blended? Like no blender. Like, oh yeah, whatever works. I don't know. I don't. I don't have a preference. Um, I know our artists on other teams are split. Max Maya, Substance is pretty well integrated. Um, we're doing some stuff on the uh, the photogrammetry side. If you go on our blog and the VFX side, you can see how they did the sets for Adam that way. Um, so if you want to get into doing that, it's pretty amazing. Whatever, whatever you need. It depends also on what. You're you know, if you're making Snoopy Pop or something, let's say, uh, that's all probably Illustrator and some and some uh, cartooning program. Okay, am I missing more? Uh, yeah. So it's just that you know, you learned by doing it a lot of many times. Mm -hmm. Could you have your thing like, let's say for example, you have it do like you have to change it, and it will hit the car or not? Like like so it's instead of we'll see. Mm -hmm. If the car is being like hit or not, could you somehow make that not like do like half and half and like a big chance? Since it's machine learning and it's like learning by doing, could you have a car that's controlled by a person mm -hmm. hit and not? Yeah. Um, we're talking about this the idea of a negative reward after. Typically, we use positive rewards because negative rewards very quickly spiral into fear and agents curled in fetal poses and it's a mess. Um, so typically we tend to see a either a positive or neutral reward structure. Um, the other thing you could do in that is to couple it with, couple reinforcement learning with imitation learning, where you're saying, I am driving correctly, please learn from it, like that. or um, I am driving incorrectly, Right, and hence it is a neutral. It is a, it is a not positive. So you could learn from. Um, and could you, you know, put a player-based car in with a box collider and smack into a machine learning agent while it's learning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's one thing I'm working on right now. I'm, you know, because Indiana Jones being near and dear to me, I'm going to roll a giant ball into something and have it smack into an agent because, you know. Because why not smack agents into things, right? 
Got to work on the spiders for that. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, I feel like there would be. I know on the machine learning side, it depends on if you're using agent with visual capabilities, who's going to, that would be prime for that, right? Where you have an agent that sees what it's doing versus a raycast. Outside of that, um, I'm sure if you peruse the forums, there's probably a how do I make this suck less question that somebody's asked. You know, and if it uh, warms up enough to like, again, make toast, you know, great. I don't know specifically on that one. I have heard really good things about the EG, eGPUs. I haven't had a chance to play because I haven't had haven't needed to. When Apple did show our Book of the Dead at their, you know, WWDC, um, that was running on a MacBook on the external. It's it, it going to get a lot to the screen. You know, as long as you're not a road warrior, not a big deal. Um, so I was thinking, just watching my time here a little bit. Um, how many, I was going to offer a couple of things outside of machine learning just in Unity, just to bring out some new stuff. The things I was going to show briefly, just to, because I know I've had filled some requests on um, cinematography and previs, and also materials and newest, latest, greatest flashiness. Um, I wanted to show a little bit about scriptable, scriptable rendering pipeline stuff. That's all interesting. And uh, just to touch on the post effects. Sound reasonable? Any other requests? Um, if I have any time left, I'll be able to substance work because I really love the substance design. Okay. All right. Um, how many have played with one of the uh, one of the other SRP flavors? Do you know what that is? For those who don't, um, this has been a big thrust of Unity in the past couple of years. And if you're working either in the real time space or game space or something like that, you can see this. Um, rendering has always been a bottleneck actually rendering. When you render on device, when you render on screen, it's always a bottleneck. And a lot of what we do are tricks to make things look good while preserving the real-timeness of real-time rendering. And Joe, one point in Copenhagen, sorry, Rocamonte founder, uh, basically said, I need to rewrite the rendering pipeline, because typically we're using forward or deferred, and there's trade-offs with each. You either take a kick in the head and processor power, or you get things that are fast and look, eh, okay. We do. And so you came up with the idea of the scriptable rendering pipeline, where it allows you to customize for different aims. So we have lightweight, we have HD. Lightweight is made for phones, phones you can strap on your face, um, all kinds of fun, right? It's purposely lightweight, it's made to render fast. HD is, you know, this computer is going to melt the table it's sitting on, it's getting so hot, but it looks gorgeous. Um, so again, HD, we're talking about console, we're talking about desktop, and lightweight, we're talking about VR and phone. So what does that look like? What does that do? So when you make a new project, where's my hub? Where's my hub? Right? You get a choice. We've got HD, we've got lightweight, we've got VR. These are in preview right now. They've been around for a while. They're pretty stable. They're calling them preview still because there's, it's a huge technological undertaking. But I'm going to go lightweight here and just make a new new thing. What this allows you to do is actually rewrite the rendering pipeline. Now I'm talking also about job possibilities. Because I know you're all sparkly and interested in maybe getting paid for this. Where are things going? What do people want? They want, to, want folks that understand rendering and graphics and optimization and customizing the rendering pipeline. So if any of you have a tech artist bent, or a graphics bent, or, I don't know, like to make stuff look good cheaply, right? Worth looking at. The idea in Lightweight is it's primarily a forward renderer, right? That's how it calculates the passes, <coughs> beauty, depth, and so on. Um, what this also gives us access to are things like shader graph, node-based materials in Unity, which is magical. They always load stuff in. I make a new project, and it's like, here's a gaggle of stuff. All right. What they also did with this is say, 
you can configure very strongly how good your renderer is. That's a huge deal because there has not been control like that previously. Usually it's been, here's the renderer, figure out how to unfartle this, right? And make it run fast. Oh, your phone caught on fire because it was going too hard, right? That kind of thing. Um, what they did then is put in a lot of controls in the scriptable section there, um, to allow you to configure your render pipeline. So if you played with it at all, this is how it looks. I'll zoom in. There's my base scene, good stuff on it. What this basically says is, there you go. And I apologize, the Unity UI might be a little hard to see. What this basically says is, we're running lightweight. What do we want in here? Are we running an HDR? What is our anti-aliasing doing? What are we doing in terms of shadow quality, shadow cascades? How good are they? Quickly. So it's an optimization right off the bat. Very cool stuff. What you'll see then is if you start to make new stuff in here, like materials, uh, let's go with shaders. Standard, do I want a standard? When we start to play materials, you'll see it all named. I know it's microtext, lightweight pipeline. It's made for it. So it gives you that opportunity to really optimize right off the bat, lightweight, cool stuff. What this also says is, you notice, right, we're not seeing detail maps. There's a lot of stuff we're not seeing. It says, here's things that are a kick in the head in rendering, like transparency, like overlaid textures in alpha, right, like details. We're going to take them out to its optimization. If you're interested in mobile, worth a look. Now, what this also gives us is this. And this is where stuff gets fun. Because, because I love this. Shader graph. So if you wanted to play with node-based materials in Unity, right, and do all kinds of cool stuff, and it's a PBR shader, it's available. How many have played a shader graph? Anybody? Yay, magical. Good. Just wanted to make sure we're on it. Okay. What does this give you for you artists out there? What does this give you flexibility in doing? basing things on time, right? Easy stuff like rim shades, Fresnel-based or other ones. Math, for your math folk. What's that? Good, thank you. Um, gives you all kinds of fun. Comparisons, matrices, scene input, right? All the stuff that makes materials really dynamic. It's available in here and becomes a shader, yeah. Well, pardon? Yeah, it is. Go get it on Unity. Latest build. Uh, Shader Graph premiered in 2018.1. Uh, so any version past 2018.1, it'll be in there. It has to be part of either a lightweight or an HD render pipeline. So if you choose the 3D or 3D with extras, it's not there, right? So you have to choose one of those pipelines. Yeah. Is there a way we can make a shader? Based on the machine learning model. <laughs> yeah. I mean, shader, if you if you look, example, if you're looking at RGBAs, it's a vector four. So yeah. You can make them talk. So yeah, I mean if you let's see. We're working on a a thing with some guys in a place at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um where depending on machine learning agent actions, shaders change to perhaps show an agent something is available. Like yes. It's like a, like a high quality render, and then we create it in Unity, and then take those images and have the shaders train the child, and then make some kind of a few hours out of it. Yeah, actually, if you look on our blog and these other places, there is a lot of work going on in machine, I'll call it machine learning material guessing, but there's a, there's a better name for it. We're basically, uh, based on either desired looks or what's going on in the scene based on a color script, machine learning agents are learning to correctly create materials, uh, even down to diagnosing the finer points of, of uh, BRDF and other things. So yes, um, if you'd like to have your head explode, yes, I'd highly recommend looking into it. It's fun. 
Okay, so some of you played with Shader Graph. This is great. Spacebar makes nodes. Get in there, play with it. One of my favorites always in this, it's just this kind of stuff, right? Could you do this in code? Yeah. Do you want, how many say, oh, oh, let's go code some shader? No, <laughs> don't do that. No. No. It's actually a lot of fun, but now it's available to the rest of us artists out there and sort of things get magical because, you know, can I code that? Yeah. Is it gonna suck? Yeah. Would I rather do it this way and make a rim shade, right? Like such for a rim shade emissive and shader graph. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's a good one. How comparable is it for substance versus substance designer? You know, this can you do a lot of oh, sorry, let me let me quantify this. Shader graph understands you're often still working with input textures, right? Made somewhere. There's a lot of nodes that say, how do we handle this? Um, there is a lot of proceduralism you can do here in Shader Graph. I find that the, the breadth of nodes available in Substance Designer is greater, it's just around long. However, Shader Graph gives you the ability to feed in scene inputs, um, world up versus model up, uh, view versus um, object normal, right? Things that Substance doesn't necessarily have because it doesn't understand that. So where, where Substance Designer, I think, for me, it feels like node-based Photoshop, right? There's a lot of inputs that don't necessarily exist in Substance Designer that I might want for shaders. The classic one's the snow shape, right? If you're at a certain Y um, and facing within some variation of Y zero, please have snow. You do that here with a little work. In Substance, it's workable, but getting it to understand that is a little quirky. So it's, it's not that they're, um, they, they, it's not, I don't know if they compete as much. I use one to author stuff for the other sometimes. I know Algorithmic is working on lightweight versions of Substance Designer, which would be glorious, because then you do it there and bring it in here. Amazing. Uh, other questions? I'll show, I'm going to show post effects. Yeah. Quick question. And this is mainly for the lake or one that you have been UT. Okay. It says that they're putting new stuff in particles. What is that mean for particle system? Already in. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. So, okay, two parts to that. Um, by the way, the blog I keep mentioning, if you go on Unity, there are blogs, and there are blogs from all different teams. Our VFX guys in Paris have a spectacular blog of spectacular stuff that's spectacular. Go go there, read the thing, get the stuff. Uh, they may even have some public repos. The things we're seeing in particles right now, um, custom data outputs, um, a lot of work on sub-emitters and spawns, uh, a lot of work on texture sheets and animation, and sprites as particles and things, including animations. That's already there. More stuff on the via hex side, go look on the blog. Um, yep, last one I wanted to touch on. I think this is kind of cool. And this is again for you cinematographers out there. I'll let you guys get in and play with Shader Graph. Is this, right? Post-processing, how many have played with the post effects in 2018 or 2017, two and later? Oh, stuff, okay, great. Post effects have traditionally been a kick in the head. It was an effect you added on, and now it's integral, it's amazing. Three big components to it. There is a post-process volume. Where is the post-processing occurring? So you can have multiple volumes. You can be in black and white land and go run into color land, okay? Um, where is it occurring? What is it occurring on, in this case, the camera? And what's happening? So you can see here, my main camera says post-process layer. What are we affecting in it? The post-processing layer, what's our anti-aliasing? Okay, good. Then the volume says where, or is it global? And finally, there is post-processing, there are post-processing profiles. What does that mean? Color grading, modeled on DaVinci Resolve. Okay, why would I show this and talk about cinematography? Beyond moving stuff around, I'm a firm believer in real-time lensing of stuff as close to real render as possible. So you know what's going on, where to put your detail, what's out of focus, what does your color grade look like, and so on, right? I want to give my DPs all the tools they can, they can handle in real time. So in this case, right, I'm working with either neutral aces or custom, 
Uh, if you want to get a profile in, you can, right, for my color. I'm working in, I don't know, all kinds of fun, right? When I start to work with my trackballs and other ones, okay. Um, or lift gamma gain. I mean, you tell me what mode you want to work in and have fun with it. So hopefully this is starting to show very nice sensitivity on those to color tint again in real time. Okay. Now, the other thing we've gotten here, let me turn that off, in that post, and again, this is fairly magic, bloom. Hooray for bloom because, you know, glow makes everything better. Okay. But again, Available real time, and the idea in the post processing stack is it's very, very optimal. So you can stack on all the effects, and it's not this enormous hit in performance like it used to be. And lastly, again, for you cinematographers, why do this? I'd like to add in, not vignetting, I'd like to add in from Unity depth of field. That's a huge one for me, right? Working in real time cinematography. I want to, in real time, be able to say, I want to say, let's open up this so you can see what's going on here. What is my focus distance? What is my aperture? What is my focal length? And what is my blur size? So I'm going to yank, I'm going to pull up my aperture, right? I'm going to play with my focus distance back and forth, okay? I really want to play with this, again, in real time, so I can say not only how am I composing the shot, but where am I composing the shot? That's a huge one. Where are we seeing this implemented so you can think about it? Car commercials made in real time, right? People are doing, I'll call them design films, right? In real time. We're seeing this used in previs on sets. Uh, early version got used in uh, Jungle Book, all the Baymax films that are out now. <coughs> The new, the new three that were a Disney, uh, Disney Unity collaboration. Okay. Worth playing with, because you can stack them on your cameras, you can have different cameras with different profiles, and you can have different volumes to say, let's tell that story with the post, right? Real time through. Okay. Now, can you max this out? Yes, right? If you start to put on everything and motion blur, Stuff gets a little crazy. You can make your computer catch on fire. Right? But I encourage you, when you're thinking about your cinematography, to play with that. Say, not only what's in focus, but where is in focus. That's a big I am watching my time here, so I'm going to be cognizant of it. I'll field questions for a while afterwards. Um, I, know, I wouldn't mind a little cranky substance demo somewhere if we can stand in. Okay. Um, again, my name is Adam Crespi. I'm with Unity Machine Learning. Thank you all very much for coming and asking so many good questions. Thank you.